Uh, good welcome once again to this uh, nightly presentation. And uh, I just want to thank the Lord for uh, giving us uh, another opportunity to be able to share his uh, word. And uh, I know as uh, we continue in, in this series of uh, the prophets and uh, the messenger, that um, we shall be enriched and uh, the Lord will continue uh, blessing uh, our souls. And so I just want to welcome us to this uh, presentation. Today we have uh, number 27 in our presentation. This is uh, number 27. And... Uh, uh, we are looking at uh, we are looking at uh, this is number twenty eight. A closer look at what Kellogg believed. A case study of what he meant rather than what uh, uh, people think he meant. Th this is so critical in uh, uh, our presentations because uh, of what E. G. White had to say about uh, what Kellogg was uh, propagating, and so. Uh, I'd like us to be able to pray. I'd like us to be able to pray, and then uh, we shall see what the Lord wants us to learn. We are live on uh, uh, all our Facebook pages, and uh, I pray that um, we can spread this far and wide, and uh, the Lord um, will bless us all. And so I want us to pray and then uh, continue in this uh, presentation. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again, thank you for the opportunity of being able to study these histories. We pray that uh, as we study the history of uh, our heritage, we may be able to not repeat this history in this negative way and uh, that our minds may do the things that you require us to do. Help us, Lord, to be true to your word now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, a case study of uh, what Kellogg meant rather than what people think that he meant. This is very interesting. And um, I'd like to hear your views. I like to hear your opinion. I like to see the history that you have. And uh, I welcome a positive uh, criticism of what uh, I'm going to present. And so right away, I'll delve into uh, this uh, presentation. Let us look at a little history of uh, 1893 to 1906 as we venture into all this stuff. And uh, uh, I just want to say in presenting this, my quest for truth has led me to examine closely the history of uh, our movement, not uh, bragging about this. A sad thing has happened among us that uh, the only thing we learn from history is we do not learn. That is the most saddest thing, that uh, the only thing we can learn from our history is that we do not learn. And uh, so I pray that... Uh, it be not our position that this sad history be repeated to us. We should learn and never repeat the mistake. And uh, the crisis of the living temple and succeeding story starts somewhere, and that is where uh, we want just to start it. But um, before I, I look up at this lead-up story, I, I wouldn't go into the background of uh, the demise of Kellogg's parents and Ellen White's charge of uh, responsibility. I tried to look at it in the previous uh, uh, presentation, number 27, and how she was charged to care for him. Uh, that is addressed uh, in the previous video a little bit and uh, some other places. If uh, you want the background history of that, uh, you can conduct me. But uh, I'd like just to give a synopsis of the events that led up to his uh, beliefs. And uh, first up, we travel back to Minneapolis 1888 session that ends in division and uh, people taking sides. And uh, the aftermath in 1893 
E.G. White saying that uh, Kellogg was converted man and everyone knew about it. And so things just start to develop and another group develop. That is the Kellogg camp when he is uh, 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 frustrated with the powers that be and then they could not uh, bring together the message, uh, the, arm of, the, the right arm of the message and the gospel being intertwined together. And so thinking that the, uh, the officers were slow to implement this and we read a quote which I see where it was agreed that he should not be brought in the camp meeting and some of the elders uh, were, uh, uh, were guilty of bringing it and when Kellogg saw it, he bought all of it and destroyed it. And so now due to their manipulating of things, the Lord will not tolerate it and the sanitarium burned down in 1892 when Kellogg tried to make uh, the sanitarium an undenominational and so the sanitarium burned down in February 1890-1902 and then we had the plates of uh, the printing of the living temple again the publishing house in December 30 1902 burned down the living temple itself was published in 1903 and so all these fires connected to the book uh, the living temple and it is scientific theories which undermine the presence and personality of God which uh, E.G. White says that we should never enter into controversy of it. Below, we shall be seeing, as we continue, uh, the quotes in their chronological order and what was happening. During the fires, uh, the plates of the living temple were destroyed in 1902 prior to its release. And uh, the Lord didn't want anything of that sort to come out from our houses. And uh, when you read pamphlets, E.G. White says that I saw the Lord had cleansed uh, our institution. So let us go to the lead up story of uh, the whole issue. And uh, for the sake of um, uh, more relevance of the information, I'll be able to share up my screen. So in letter 23, a, 1893, we read, if the echo office was to mean no more to our people than a secular publishing house, if it was to be conducted on the same principles as were other business institutions, then it was not wise to invest so much means in establishing the house, the office. It would have been less expense to hire our printing done by outside parties. How much longer will God bear with your perversity, unless there is a reformation, calamity will overtake the publishing house and the world will know the reason. I have been shown that there has not been a turning to God with full purpose of heart. The Lord is dishonored in the institutions erected for his honor. The marked disregard of God's commandments in the publishing house has placed its impress on the workers. God asks, shall I not judge for these things? I saw heavenly angels turning away with grieved countenances. God has been mocked by your hardness of heart, which is continually increasing. According to their responsibility will be the punishment of those who know the truth and yet disregards God's commandment. Letter 138.19.01. Now, why is she talking like this about uh, our publishing house, the Review and the Herald? It is because of uh, some disappointment that she had got where the great controversy, the book which was to be circulated to all over the world was lying on the shelf while uh, the publishing house was engaged in merchandise and promoting the books that they knew it will bring more profit to them and not have the impact of saving souls as it should be. But um, it was more of a commercial thing. And then she is asking, why do we have to have a publishing house and then invest in it so much if it should be run like any worldly enterprise? And so there was a lot of commercialism going on and uh, you can read uh, these things uh, wherever you, uh, you, uh, you can in uh, Adventist history. And so she laments on this while the great controversy was lying on the shelf, not being printed. And then we have now the living temple coming up and uh, Dr. Kellogg are uh, being able to persuade uh, more powers, uh, the powers that be in Battle Creek so that this book may be printed. 
Uh, continued on, we read, you have given matter containing certain sentiments into the hands of the workers, uh, bringing his deceptive, polluting principles before their minds. This is talking to Kellogg now in letter 138.19.01. The Lord looks upon this action on your part as helping Satan to prepare his snare to catch souls. God will not hold guiltless those who have done this thing. He has a controversy with the managers of the publishing house. I have been almost afraid to open the review, fearing to see that God has cleansed the publishing house by fire. The $5,000 which would be used in erecting the addition to the review and herald should be invested in the work in other places. Now, you, you remember also that uh, E.G. White had been in a, uh, was sent to Australia without help. And then she asked for means to start little institutions or small institutions everywhere in Australia. But there was the response, there is no money. But what was the money doing? The money was erecting mammoth buildings back in the USA. And so she laments of these situations that were happening in USA. And uh, the, the same crisis that uh, actually Sister White had in her days are the same crisis that we have. We have been told that uh, we should not be building mammoth buildings, but uh, small institutions everywhere to be spread around the four corners of the world. But you will find that men are investing so much in one place and centralize, centralizing rather than spreading the message all over. This is the presentation uh, um, uh, we are dealing with is um, a closer look at what Kellogg believed, a case study of what he meant rather than what people think he meant. And so, Again, we continue reading that um, I feel a tear of soul as I see to what a pass our publishing house has come. The presses in the Lord's institution have been printing the soul destroying theories of Romanism and other mysteries of iniquity. So, whatever was being published in uh, our publishing houses, she says they are destroying theories of Romanism and other mysteries of iniquity. This is taking all sacrifice, sacredness from the office. The managers are loading the guns of the enemy and placing them in their hands to be used against the truth. How does God regard such a work? In the books of heaven are written the words and faithful stewardship. Thus God regards the publication of matter which comes from Satan's manufactory, his hellish scientific delusion. Remember, it is only... Uh, the living temple that Ellen White referred to as advanced science. Read the, you can read the whole of MS 63A in 1906 about how Kellogg had been chosen and how now he had turned from the Lord to pursue the wisdom of the men in the world and bring in the supposed advanced scientific theories. Again, in uh, MS 45, 1906, we read, the office must be purged of this objectionable matter, the living temple. I have a testimony from the Lord for those who have placed such a matter in the hands of the workers. God holds you accountable for presenting to young men and young women in the fruit, the fruit of the forbidden tree of knowledge. Can it be possible that you have not a knowledge of the warnings given to the Pacific press on this subject? Can it be possible that with a knowledge of them you are going over the same ground, only doing much worse? It has often be repeated to you that angels of God are passing through every room in the in the office. What impression has this made on your minds? And uh, quotes on the word matter added by me for emphasis. A brief mention of the destruction of the Pacific Press is uh, in MS 45, 1906. And uh, you can still find it in uh, uh, the link uh, you can see on the screen, en.wikipedia.org slash wiki slash pacific underscore press underscore uh, publishing Association. Now, in letter 138, 1901, she had said, the Lord has instructed me that those who cannot see the wickedness of cooperating with Satan by publishing his falsehood might better seek some work in which they will not ruin our youth, body, and soul. And uh, in one of the places she says, if matters are brought to the publishing house and we know they undermine the pillars of our faith, those who are working in the publishing houses should refuse to print the matter. And even if they are unemployed or resigned, they should uh, accept it rather than print falsehood that will go in the four corners of the world and bring delusions to the souls. Then 
um, it is a high time that we understood what man of spirit has been controlling matters at the Review and Herald office for years. I am horrified to think that the most subtle face of spiritualism should be placed before the workers and that in a way calculated to confuse and perplex the mind. Be assured that Saturn will follow up the advantage thus given him later 138.19.01. Continued on, the Review and Herald office has been defiled as the temple was defiled. Only the result has been tenfold more disastrous. Overturning the tables of the money changes, Christ drove the sheep and cattle from the pressing gates of the temple, saying, It is written, My father's house shall be called a house of prayer, but he have made it a den of thieves. Worse even than the defilement of the temple has been the defilement of the publishing house by the printing of matter which should never have been placed in the hands of the workers in God's institution. Uh, and uh, God's law has been transgressed, his uh, cause betrayed, and his institution made a den of thieves. The work of printing and circulating starring appeals for the truth, which should have been placed first, to which the time and the talent of the workers should have been devoted, has received little or no attention. And this is referring to the, uh, the great controversy. Uh, the commercial work, some of it of a most objectionable character, has gradually assumed the supremacy. The, this work has absorbed the energies which should have been devoted to the publication of literature of the purest quality and the most elevating character. Time has been wasted, talent misapplied, and money misappropriated. The work which ought to have been done has been left undone. Certain sentiments have been exalted. His theories have been printed by presses which should have been used to prepare the truth of God for circulation. Men have coveted promotion when their principles were under the ban of God's displeasure. Laws is infinitely better than dishonorable gain. And so that is the lead up story to Kellogg's crisis and uh, the burning up of the sanitarium and the burning up of the publishing uh, house in the year 1902. But uh, let us continue on and uh, see some of these things. The burning of uh, sanitarium and review in 1902. Uh, this is uh, being uh, recorded in 1903. Now, this is John Harvey Kellogg. During the years leading up to the turn of the century, Dr. Kellogg had begun to introduce pantheistic teachings, God in everything in the general conference sessions. Uh, these teachings were a departure from the foundational truth regarding the personality of God in Christ. By 1901, pantheism was rampant in Battle Creek. In February of 1902, the Battle Creek sanitarium was destroyed by fire. Dr. Kellogg was commissioned to write a new book, the sale of which would aid rebuilding costs. His book was to be called The Living Temple. He was warned not to include his new theories in it, but he did. In December of the same year, the Review and the Herald Publishing House burned to the ground with the plates of Kellogg's new book. In 1901, Ellen White had written, I have been almost afraid to open the review, fearing to see that God has claimed the publishing house by fire. Letter 138, 1901. And remember, she is writing this, and the sanitarium burns down in February, and then the battle, the, the, the publishing house burns in uh, December, the same year, 1902, while she wrote about this uh, issue in 1901. Just to prove that um, this was a messenger of the Lord, that she could see things that will happen if apostasy will be embraced by the office at the battle creek. Her fear materialized when she heard of the review and the Herald fire. Now, Dr. Kellogg, Kellogg was offered the suggestion of writing a simple book on physiology and healthcare that could be sold by Colpotuas. He jumped at the opportunity and wrote The Living Temple with it is Hinduistic sentiments. Working rapidly, Kellogg dictated the contents of the book to a secretary who then typed it out. Soon the book had been typed set at the nearby Review and Herald office, and garlic proofs of the living temple were handed to W.W. Prescott to look at. He was shocked and took them to Elder W.A. Spicer. Now, it just so happened that uh, Elder Spicer has been, had been for many years a missionary in India, and when he read Kellogg's book, he was astounded. Here were Hindu pantheism right in front of him and slated to be printed soon and sent out to the four winds for reading and selling by Seventh-day Adventists across North America. But when question came to Kellogg or his associates about the matter, 
they replied that it was advanced light for the church and that should settle the matter. The book was no problem to Kellogg's associates, for he had been grinding these ideas into their minds for several years. Waiting for Kellogg's return to town from business trip, Spicer then made an appointment to visit with him at his large home. Spicer later wrote up the, the afternoon discussion. And uh, you can read the whole of um, this issue between Spicer and Kellogg in How the Spirit of Prophecy Met a Crisis by W.A. Spicer. I'll just pick some few uh, excerpts from the book uh, and uh, share the discussion that uh, they had. And uh, remember, the presentation is uh, um, uh, the, the presentation is um, a closer look at what Kellogg believed, a case study of what he meant rather than what people think he meant. You know, sometimes we take somebody's manuscript and we say, oh, I think this person thinks like this and like that. But there is the ideas before your face, what this person thinks rather than what you think the person thinks. And so the... Questions and answers that uh, Spice ahead with Kellogg can give us a clear understanding of what uh, this brother uh, actually uh, believed. And uh, I'll go through some uh, few excerpts, excerpts on this. Um, this is the question, where is God? I was asked. I will naturally say this is a, 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 this is a, a conversation between uh, Kellogg and Spicer. So, where is God? I was asked. I will naturally say he is in heaven. There the Bible pictures the throne of God, all the heavenly beings at his command as messengers between heaven and earth. But I was told that God was in the grass and plants and in the trees. Again, where is heaven? I was asked. I had my idea of the center of the universe with heaven and throne of God in the midst but uh, disclaimed any attempt to fix, locate the center of the universe astronomically. But I was urged to understand that heaven is where God is, and God is everywhere, in the grass, in the trees, in all creation. There was no place in the scheme of things for angels going between heaven and earth, for heaven was here and everywhere. The cleansing of the sanctuary that we thought about was not something in a faraway heaven. Now, you remember, this is why Sister White said, when she looked at what Kellogg had written, the sanctuary was gone, atonement was gone. And she says that uh, some of the sentiments in the living temple are true, but then nature has been put where God is and God put where nature should be. The, the things had been uh, uh, backflipped and... Uh, you, you can uh, see by these questions and answers by W. Spicer and uh, Kellogg. Summarizing his afternoon conversation with Dr. Kellogg, Elder Spicer said this, I knew well enough that there was nothing of the Advent message that could fit into such a, a philosophy. As I had listened, one light after another of the gospel message seemed to be put out. Religious teaching that to me was fundamental was set aside. Now, just a backup, it should be remembered that uh, the apostates of Kellogg and Bellinger in the 1903 and 1905 crisis was termed the alpha of apostasy. Uh, Living Temple was, we are told in 1 SM 2 3, paragraph 2, that uh, it contains the alpha of these theories, the alpha of apostasy. And... Um, Sister White says that I knew that the Omega will follow in a little while and I tremble for our people. Now, the story of uh, F.A. Bellinger is so interesting, so interesting that uh, uh, he came to challenge the message of the sanctuary. And you can look up at the Historia in Wikipedia or Adventist history and you will be able to find these stories. Now, in uh, letter 263 in 1904, she warned that the omega will be of the most startling nature. Now, it is interesting, the word startling, it, it, it means that uh, it will come in a way that people do not recognize it. If the living temple, the people who are so learned will not understand that this was a clear departure from the truth, how about uh, the omega when it comes, by the way? Keep in mind that the alpha involved both by Kellogg and by Bellinger, a repudiation of a basic sanctuary message and uh, a two-apartment actual building in heaven 
with Jesus as our high priest in that sanctuary from AD 31 on down to 1844 in the first apartment and from 1844 onward to the close of probation in the second as he carries out the final atonement in connection with the examining of the records. These things actually, when you come to Kellogg message and the Bellinger's message, you find that it sweeps away the whole economy uh, of the plan of redemption. And so a careful study of both aspects of this twin apostasy of 1903 to 1905 will disclose that both denied this basic truth that has to do with atonement. The new theology in our day denies it also, and many of our young pastors no longer believe in a two apartment sanctuary in heaven or in several other of the above stated points of the ministry of Christ within it. That is uh, 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 what happened in AD 31 and what happened in uh, 1844. And uh, there have been an attack on the sanctuary. It is interesting when you read 2 Chronicles chapter 36, that uh, the sanctuary of uh, the ancient Israel was polluted. And when God could not reach to his people because the sanctuary was polluted, we are told there was no remedy. Because thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. And if the sanctuary is undermined, there is no way God can reach to his people because it is in the sanctuary that atonement is done and reconciliation is done. So if you sweep away the whole economy of the sanctuary, you sweep away the whole plan of the gospel, or plan of redemption and the gospel. And there is no way God can save people if it is not on the plan of the redemption and the gospel. And so Bellinger, and now you have uh, uh, Dr. Kellogg, and then uh, you come to people like uh, Harpenstone, and uh, you, you are having Desmond Ford, and uh, you, you're having people like uh, Walter Reed and some other people who have just been having a problem with the sanctuary message in Adventism, uh, uh, bringing in theories that has even shaped the denomination's understanding of atonement even today. And so you don't hear so much about atonement in uh, in our churches today. And why is it so? Because the enemy has made it so. Once you obscure the sanctuary and uh, the Father and the Son and the Spirit in how they work, there, there is no way you can, re, 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 you can uh, reconcile your misunderstanding of uh, the people involved in the sanctuary with the work of the sanctuary itself. Once you have a wrong perception and understanding of the people involved in the sanctuary itself, you have a wrong service going on there. So the foundation of faith, which was established by so much prayer, Sister White says in uh, MS 46, 1904, such an honest searching of the scriptures was being taken down pillar by pillar. Our faith was to have nothing to rest upon. The sanctuary was gone. The atonement was gone. And I just want to share that in MS 46, 1904. MS, uh, let me see if I can find this uh, very quick. When she looked at everything, I, I don't want this to be taken as my words. Uh, when uh, she says that... Um, the atonement was gone. Yes, I'll try and uh, find these things. She saw that, uh, yes, um, the sanctuary. Bear with me, sanctuary was gone, atonement, atonement was gone too. This is in uh, MS 461904, and uh, I have it, I'll just be able to share it now. Um, now, look at this. 
the foundation of our faith. This is also found in Someone in Talks, Volume 1, the entire manuscript. But uh, this is what I want to read to you. And uh, uh, I have to highlight this and uh, put in some color. Now, in uh, a representation which passed before me, I saw a certain work being done by medical missionary workers. Not missionary worker which will be referring to Kellogg, but he's saying medical missionary worker. So everyone who was associated with Kellogg was doing, had imbibed his errors and they were doing a certain work which was uh, of much ruin. So in uh, a representation which passed before me, I saw a certain work being done by medical missionary workers. Our minister in Britain were looking on watching what was being done, but they did not seem to understand. That is how it was the omega will be of the startling nature. If alpha could not be understood, how about the omega? The foundation of our faith, which was established by so much prayer, such an honest searching of the scriptures, was being taken down pillar by pillar. Our faith was to have nothing to rest upon. The sanctuary was gone. The atonement was gone. I realized that something must be done. But look at what she says next. The battle has nearly killed me. I saw what was coming in and I saw that our brethren were blind. They did not realize the danger. Our young people especially were in danger. They delighted in the beautiful representations, God in the flower, God in the leaf, God in the tree. But if God be in these things, why not worship them? That is the question now she asked the people. If God is in these things, why not make them an entity and worship them? And so you can find Whatever W.A. Spicer was reporting about the conversation with Kellogg was true, that Kellogg told him God is everywhere, the throne of he the, the, the heaven is everywhere, God was in grass, God, God was in tree, because this is what Sister White is reporting also, meaning that uh, what Spicer was saying that was in uh, Hindu mysticism was actually true. Some people have uh, tried to say that uh, Arthur Spicer had uh, some hatred of some of the pioneers and all that stuff and what he was presenting about Kellogg and other people was not true but whatever Spicer we have read what Spicer said above is what exactly what also Sister White is saying so Sister White says that the battle nearly killed me when she thought about these things no let us continue reading on Dr. Kellogg refused to accept the general conference committee's reasonable decision against publication of the living temple in defiance, Dr. Kellogg personally funded the printing of the book at the Review and Herald. Many believe that God could no longer protect his printing establishment. Approximately one month after Dr. Kellogg's order was placed, the Review and Herald building was burned to the ground and the plates already prepared for the printing of the living temple were destroyed with it. The General Conference confronts apostasy. And uh, I just want to uh, uh, highlight, I wanted to highlight that by Russell R. Standish and uh, Colin D. Standish. Now, it had been hoped that in connection with the destruction of the book plates in the Review and Herald fire, Dr. Kellogg would abandon the matter of publishing the Living Temple. But uh, instead, he sent the manuscript to a commercial printer in Battle Creek. 3,000 copies of the book were printed and began to make their way among Seventh-day Adventists. In due time, in the summer of 1903, a copy of the Living Temple arrived at El Elm Shaven, but Ellen White did not look at it. In September of that year, she was compelled to speak out plainly against these errors. She said, I have some things to say to our teachers in reference to the new book, The Living Temple. Be careful how you sustain the sentiments of this book regarding the personality of God. As the Lord represents matters to me, these sentiments do not bear the endorsement of God. They are a snare that the enemy has prepared for these last days. I thought that this would surely be designed and that it will not be necessary for me to say anything about it. But since the claim has been made that the teachings of this book can be sustained by statements from my writings, I was compelled to speak in denial of this claim. Letter 211, 1903. When the message was read at the council in Washington, Dr. Kellogg responded favorably, saying that he had accepted the testimony and that he would modify the wording in the living temple dealing with theological matters, but his statements were rather erratic and changeable. His attitude alternated, and it finally turned out that the doctor never really changed. And how do we know this? In MS 46, 1904, we read, 
these sentiments have had uh, in subsequent concerns, this, uh, these sentiments have had an effect on our people everywhere. Some think it's strange that I write, do not send your children to Battle Creek. I was instructed in regard to the danger of the worldly influence in Battle Creek. I have, been, I have written hundreds of pages regarding the danger of having so large a sanitarium and of calling so many young people together in one place. The young people in Battle Creek are in danger. They will come in contact with error. Years ago, I did not think that they would meet these errors right in the sanitariums. But when Living Temple came out and some of our ministers, we shall be seeing who are some of these ministers, told me that there was in it nothing but what I had been teaching all my life. I saw how great the danger was. I saw that blindness had fallen upon some who had long known the truth. I pray that the Lord will open the eyes of these ministers, that they may see the difference between light and darkness and between truth and error. MS 46, 1904. In MS 57, 1906, she says, My instructor said, This is no case, this is no case must be. They have had warnings in the past over and over again for 18 or 20 years, but have not fully heeded these warnings. There are those who have had no heart in the matter of moving out of Auckland, but have been opposing their resistance to the instruction that have been given, and their unbelief has strengthened with the spirit of opposition to the movement. The Lord's message was out of the cities break up the continual temptation to engage in commercial business, which has been such a great injury to the work. A failure to heed the messages given and repeated for years has been a decided injury to the souls of many. In MS 73, 1906, all heaven is interested in the work in which we are engaged. We must do a solid, not a superficial work. I am grieved when I see our printing offices doing so much commercial work, virtually saying to the world, bring your work to us, we will do it for you. We have more work for the Lord than we can possibly perform. There is much to be done than we will overlook unless we are baptized with the Holy Spirit. We desire that commercialism shall be purged from every office. Now, you know, when people enter into much commercialism and uh, the, the their motivation of doing the work is for the gaining of money, designing spiritual things actually eludes them because spiritual things are spiritual design and uh, it needs a clear eyesight, not a Laodicean's eyesight to be able to discern between truth and error. But once people make the love of money their priority, even the very basic things and open things to be understood becomes a mountain and uh, uh, difficult for them to uh, understand. And so someone may interject and, uh, okay, so sanitarium burns in uh, February 18, 1902. If Adam, if the other materials were written in 1906 to 1907, which was four years after, then which sanitarium or judgment was she referring to when she said his judgments will be executed? Now, let it not be forgotten that Kellogg in rebellion had gone against the advice and was again rebuilding this building so as a warning of the future in view of the past was issued. And uh, in, uh, in one of the general conference uh, bulletin, uh, letters uh, 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 or articles in 1903, she had written, let the general conference offices and the publishing work be moved from Battle Creek. I know not where the place will be, whether on the Atlantic coast or elsewhere, but this, I will say, never lay a stone or a brick in Battle Creek to rebuild the review office there. God has a better place for it. He wants you to work with a different influence and connected with altogether different associations from what you have heard of late in Battle Creek. That is in General Conference Bulletin, April 6, 1903, paragraph 11. After the sanitarium and the publishing house burned down, she told them, don't lay another stone there. But in defiance, they were doing the same. And so, based on the past, she was prophesying, prophesying about the future. So the statements were made just after the publication of The Living Temple in 1903, while the great controversy sat dead in the publishing house receiving little attention instead of being circulated. And uh, in 1902, we find E.G. White lamenting, and uh, I'd like to uh, put this on the screen, about her lamentation. 
this is uh, what uh, she laments. Remember, this is uh, uh, number eight in our series, Prophets and Messengers, and we are looking at um, uh, what, um, uh, actually, a closer look at what Caleb believed, a case study of what he meant rather than what people think he meant and uh, uh, what E.G. White had to say about these things. In letter 21, 1902, she said, I feel very grateful to my heavenly father that he has heard uh, the prayers offered in my behalf. I am not in the least, I'm not in the least discouraged, but I feel very sorry that the books which should be finding red cell are lying on the office shelves. This is the great controversy. These books contain the life that the people need. May the Lord move upon many of our young men to enter the conversing field as a conversing evangelist. By the conversing work, the truth is presented to thousands that otherwise will not hear it. Our time for work is short. Many, very many need the quick, the quickly in them to lead them to arouse and go to work. The Lord calls for workers just now. Again, in MS 57.1906, while at St. Helena, again and again, it, was be, it has been revealed to me that there was not a correct state of things at Mountain View, that there were present the very condition that made it essential for the publishing work to be removed from Auckland. The original West Coast printing house in Auckland was established in 1874. Because of the growing work and the problems created by the city environment, the publishing house was moved to Mountain View in 1904. The destructive fire of July 20, 1906 effectively settled the problem of commercial printing. So she says, I saw that in the working out of human ideas and plans, there was a disregarding of the light God had given in the past to correct existing evils. There is danger that the experience of the past will be repeated. The men who are serving in the management of the work can just as surely swerve the work into lines of commercialism as in the past. Again, in 1907, this uh, the word that she had to say, years ago, I was in Battle Creek. I was much distressed that great controversy should lie idle on the shelf. For two years, it was held back that battle bubble readings might have more attention. All that I could say did not change the course of those who had control of the conversing work. They treated me as if I were a child. If at that time I had appealed to the people, asking for agents to handle my books and promising to supply them, it would have been in the order of the Lord, but now things have changed. There is not now a studied, determined effort to hold back the books that are of the most importance. We are planning to bring out many books and for the pioneer in our work to make any move now that will create confusion will not be wise. We must not bring any discouragement on our publishing houses at, the, at this critical period in their experience. That is 1907. This condition of things have been created in our conference and churches under a religious cloak which existed in the world. Confederacies have been formed to make their showing stand out superior and they have gained the name of having done a large work in their responsible position of trust. They flatter themselves that they were doing God's service where they were establishing principles of robbery. They were depriving their brethren of their rights in gathering everything in the book line under their control and making their own laws and rules, rules that were not after God's order at all, but which reveal the very attributes of Satan. It was this spirit that was manifested by the priest and temple officials in their gathering of the Passover. Cattle were bought by the dignitaries, the money men who oppressed them or whom they purchased. The representation was made that these animals were to be offered as a sacrifice to God at the Passover, and thus urged the owner sold them at a cheap price. Then these scheming men brought their purchases to the temple. Purchases which meant double robbery, robbery of the men of whom they had purchased and robbery of those who wished to sacrifice, to whom they were sold again at exorbitant price. They used the courts of the temple as though the animals brought there made them of the highest value. Oh, what a deceit, what hypocrisy was practiced. Twice Christ's displeasure was evident against them. Divinity flies through humanity and he drove out the buyers and sellers from the temple court saying, Take these things hand. It is written, My father's house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. 
He overturned the tables of the money changers and priests and people fled before that one man as though an army of soldiers with drawn swords were pursuing them. This work has been carried on at Battle Creek. The publishing office was turned from the original design. Men made terms with authors. Councils were, councils were formed. Schemes were entered into. While one author was engaged in the services of a meeting at a distance, the expenses of one man were paid to go and see this brother and induce him to put the lowest figures on his books. They argued that they wished to get this important matter before as many people as possible and that the book would have a very much larger sale if it was sold at cheap price. The royalty was placed at the lowest figure. Then this confederacy held this example up as a rule for others. Warnings were given me that all this was the working out of system of oppression and robbery and that the whole institution was leavened throughout with corrupt principles, that the light of God was fast departing from all who were engaged in this confederacy. God sanctioned none of this spirit. He could not place his signature upon this devising. He will forsake those men, remove his spirit from those who ended upon this cause, and the glory of his presence will depart from them. And then the following is worth considering fire. The following is worth considering fire chief weeks. When the sanitarium was burning and the publishing houses, this is what is recorded. There is something strange, he said, about your SDA fires. With the water poured on acting more like gasoline, other L. White, Ellen G. White, uh, the, hair, L, the early L. Elm Shaven years, 1900 to 1905. When, uh, when the fire engines came to put down the fires in the sanitarium and the publishing houses, the waters they put on them acted as gasoline. Because of the, the short changing of hands in this work, the material of E.G. White is lying on the shell, the great controversy, and people are bribing others to make sure that their books are printed and they have pantheistic ideas which they have imbibed from Kellogg. And then we have the plates of the living temple there, and when the sanitarium burns down in the publishing house and we are told never lay one stone on that ground but move somewhere else, again, they start erecting the same thing because all they want is to do business and not spread the truth. And so who was caught up in these snares? Etijones caught up. And so I'll just mention it in brief um, uh, that... Um, he reviewed the living temple and said he found nothing objectionable. That is it, Jonas. His association with the Kellogg did not work in his favor. He was one of the men who preferred the reading, the reading temple. The, uh, and here is what he had to say. Uh, I meant to write that he is who preferred the living temple. Now, Eti Jonas had to report this and... Uh, that we find in the book Living Temple nothing which appears to be to us to be contrary to the Bible or the fundamental principles of the Christian religion, and that we see no reason why it may not be recommended by the Committee for Circulation in the manner suggested. Etty Jones, J. H. Kellogg, David Paulson, quoted in How the Spirit of Prophecy Met a Crisis, page 27. Now, this issue of Etty Jones, and uh, I would like the day to rest. But uh, this is history, our history, and we cannot deny it. And by putting out the history, it doesn't mean that you hate the people who are involved in it. God puts up the history of the children of Israel and even the most noble people, he puts there the history, like David and his adultery, Moses and his swearing, and uh, 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 the sister of Aaron uh, with, he, with her leprosy and all this stuff. They are put in history that they may be an ensemble to us who have come to the ends of the world. Now, for E.T. Jones, E.G. White had told him several, do not go up to work with them, uh, Dr. Kellogg, because uh, the sentiments that uh, he's having are not the right sentiments, but he wouldn't listen. And now when he is given the living temple because he his sentence had been dead, and he says that we find nothing objectionable in this book. So as uh, we end uh, the last part of this presentation, the real controversy with Kellogg's living tempo now, uh, I think this is the gist of the matter that uh, maybe many have been waiting. Where is it? 
Now, this issue of people saying that a part of God's being is in them in, is removing God from the throne in heaven and placing him in you. Then just go ahead and pray our Father who art in us, not our Father who art in heaven. Kellogg started out that God is in everything, then modified the issue when he adopted the Trinity and said, no, it's now God, the Holy Spirit, who is in everything. So I want you to think about that for a second. He is saying the Holy Spirit, which is part of God and Christ, is in everything. He said he had come to believe in the Trinity. Letter A, letter A. G. Daniels to W. C. White, October 29, 1903, uh, uh, paragraph uh, 1 and 2. E.G. White never knew what to call it. She said, until the Lord presented it to me, I knew not what to call it, but I was instructed to call it unholy spiritual love. That you can find it in letter 230, 1903. The issue was, the issue was, is a part of God in anything? This was the, the, the controversy. And we want to see what E.G. White says and what Kellogg says, because the track of truth lies close to the track of error, and it's only by the designing uh, a spirit, gift of designing, that uh, we can be able to distinguish between the two. Now, I want to read from uh, uh, the letter A.G. Daniels to W.C. White in October 29, 1903, pages 1 and 2. Ever since the council closed, I have felt that I should write confidentially regarding Dr. Kellogg's plan for revising and republishing the living temple. He, Kellogg, said that some days before coming to the council, he had been thinking the matter over and began to see that he had made a slight mistake in expressing his views. He said that all the way along, he had been troubled to know how to state the character of God and his relation to his creation works. He then stated that his former views regarding the Trinity had stood in his way of making a clear and absolutely correct statement, but that within a short time he had come to believe in the Trinity and could now see pretty clearly where all the difficulty was and believed that he could clear the matter up satisfactorily. He told me that he now believed in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, and his views was that it was God the Holy Ghost and not God the Father that filled all space and every living thing. He said if he had believed this before writing the book, he could have expressed his views without giving the wrong impression the book now gives. I placed before him the objections I found in the teaching, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and tried to show him that the teaching was so utterly contrary to the gospel that I did not see how it could be revised by changing a few expressions. We argued the matter at some length in a friendly way, but I felt sure that when we parted, the doctor did not understand himself, nor the character of his teaching, and I could not see how it would be possible for him to flop over and in the course of a few days fix the book, books up so that it will be all right. You, you see, when you read these things, they should uh, put your antennas up. Kellogg says that his view of the Trinity had blocked him from having to give a right impression to the book. Now he had come to believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and now he could articulate well, and he could say that God the Holy Spirit was the one feeling everything and in every place. And A.G. Daniel says that, I don't see how this could reconcile with the gospel. And when they were ending their conversation, he knew that the doctor was confused. Now people today will say that uh, we understand well the Trinity, and we can articulate better things. If Daniels was around this period and we were talking about these things like this, he will say, I left this person confused, knowing that he was confused of his ideas. There, there is no way you can reconcile Trinity with the gospel. And that is what actually Kellogg was trying to do. And Sister White says that you cannot patch up the book. Just forget about it and have nothing to do with it. And so uh, I don't want to project in what Kellogg thought because the issue is what did he mean rather than what we think he meant. And it is coming out clear as we read these things what actually he meant. So far from the materials I have gone through, Kellogg denies teaching pantheism and says he is teaching exactly what Ellen White taught in the book Education Chapter 10. 
God in nature. So what did E.G. White teach then? Let us read what E.G. taught. Because Kellogg says he is teaching exactly what E.G. White taught. E.G. White said, Upon all created things is seen the embrace of the deity. Nature testifies of God. The susceptible mind brought in contact with the miracle and mystery of the universe can not but recognize the working of infinite power. Not by its own inherent energy does the earth produce its boundaries and year by year continue its motion around the sun. And I don't want to enter into this issue that um, uh, the earth doesn't go around the sun. You know, people talk a lot of things and we can just leave it at that point. But we are told the earth continues its motion around the sun. Now people will say, E.G. White was not a scientist. I'll leave it at that point. An unseen hand guides the planets in the circuit of the heavens. A mysterious life pervades all nature, a life that sustains the unnumbered worlds throughout immensity, that lives in the insect atom which floats in the summer breeze, that wins the flight of the swallow and feeds the young ravens which cry, that brings the bird to blossom and the flower to, to fruit. Now, observe what, what E.G. White is saying that... Uh, Upon nature, there is an impress of deity and there is an infinite power working in these things. And it is a mysterious life that pervades all nature. Now, and to say God, the Holy Spirit, you know, sometimes uh, the nature of the spirit is a mystery. We talk of the spirit as life. But the Holy Spirit is something so different. The Holy Spirit gets its name or appellation from the work of making something holy. So the Holy Spirit is not in the leaf because there is no way the leaf is being made holy. The Holy Spirit is not in the tree because there is no way the, holy, the, the tree is being made holy. The Holy Spirit is in the people who are being saved from degrad degradation of sin to the image of God. Now, the creation is not being made, uh, is not being recreated from sin to holiness. And so you cannot say, whichever way you want to put it, you cannot say God, the Holy Spirit, is in the nature. Just as you cannot say uh, 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 the Holy Spirit is in the, yes, the Holy Spirit is in the nature. That thing is impossible. There is no God, the Holy Spirit, in the nature. And there is nothing like a Holy Spirit in the nature. We should understand when you talk about a holy thing, what uh, actually you are talking about. It is uh, 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 something that has been either tended by sin and it is made up to be holy or something that has no sin at all. And this distinction is very important because there is a letter that I will be writing which. Um, Actually, uh, I think Daniel writes to uh, to Helog on this matter about uh, the distinction between the Holy Spirit and the Spirit. And we should understand this because I want just to add something. Sister White says that the Holy Spirit is not in the sinner. Yet we understand the Spirit is in the sinner. This, these are very crucial matters. Because we think that uh, this is splitting hairs, but this is not splitting hairs. The Holy Spirit is not in the nature. The Spirit is in the nature. The Holy Spirit is not in the sinner, but the Spirit is in the sinner. In this way, the Spirit of God works on different levels. In inanimate things, is it acts as life to sustain them. In a uh, Christian, it works as the Holy Spirit to renew the mind. But in a sinner, it is there as a life sustainer. The Spirit is there as a life sustainer and not the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is not welcome there. Because it is the Spirit of Christ and on the heart of the sinner, it is knocking. Whoever opens, the Spirit will come in, the Holy Spirit will come in and it will serve with him. But yet the sinner is not dead, meaning that he has a life that is sustaining him, but it's not the Holy Spirit. It's just life 
plain life like that. I think uh, I'll not belabor that. You can understand by those few words. But listen to what Iji White is saying. There is the embrace of the deity. There is infinite power working. There is a mysterious life in the nature. Now, in uh, Education 99.2, she says, the same power that upholds nature is working also in man. The same great laws that guide are like the star and the atom control human life. The laws that govern the heart's action, regulating the flow of the current of life to the body are the laws of the mighty intelligence that has the jurisdiction of the soul. From him, look at this, all life proceeds. And there is a particular life in the sinner, in the nature, and in a Christian. This is called omnivitality, all life, if you will. So we have the omnivitality of God. We always speak about uh, the omnipresence. And uh, we, speak, we, we speak about the omnipresence. We speak about the omnipotence. We speak about the omniscience. But we do not go ahead to speak about the omnivitality, which is life in different uh, aspects or spheres. The life that is in the nature, the life that is in the sinner, and the life that is in the Christian. In fact, we have an eternal life uh, for the Christian hid in Christ Jesus. This eternal life is not in the sinner, neither is it in nature. Otherwise, nature will be eternal, and a sinner will be eternal, and sin will be immortal. And so we should think about these things when talking about the Spirit, and not just think we can take the Holy Spirit and make it everything, and in everywhere, and in everything. So, um, all life are from is from him. Only in harmony with him can be found it is true sphere of action. Now, take, be, be very keen what E.G. White is saying. The same power that upholds nature is also working in man. But going down, he says, there is what we call all life, meaning that we have some specifics on life. And she adds on, only in harmony with him can be found it is true sphere of action. So this life that comes from God, it has, it has it is different spheres. And only in harmony with God, the every aspect of life can find it is a, a true sphere. For all the objects of his creation, the condition is the same. A life sustained by receiving the life of God, a life exercised in harmony with the Creator's will. To transgress his law, physically, mental, or moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe, to introduce discord, anarchy, and ruin. Again, she says, nature is a power, but the God of nature is unlimited in power. His works interpret his character. Those who judge him from his handiworks and not from the suppositions of great men will see his presence in everything. Very interesting. They behold his smile in the glad sunshine and his love and care for man in the rich fields of autumn. Even the adornments of the earth are seen in the grass of living green, the lovely flowers of every hue, and the lofty and varied trees of the forest testify the tender fatherly care of our God. So when we see the smile in everything, we are not seeing God in everything, but we are seeing his tender care. And this is where the confusion begins. Kellogg says God is in everything. E.G. White saying that God's presence is in everything. And she says that I'm saying exactly what Sister White is saying. And Sister White says, far be it, God forbid, that it can be sustained in from my teachings that what I'm saying is Kellogg, what Kellogg is saying. So you can see the literalism of Kellogg of God in nature. But then you can see the reality of the presence of God in nature. Something so different. When I say something is somewhere literally it cannot be said something is somewhere actually in reality take for example uh uh when you say that you are in a courtship and you love somebody and you have a phone call and you are conversing and you say in real in reality i felt this person was where i was that doesn't mean that literally the person was present with you 
because the person is on the other side and you are on the other side, but the conversation brings the reality of this person, but actually it doesn't bring the literalism of that person in that place. And uh, uh, sometimes people say these are semantics, but these semantics are so much important because they are the ones which define actually what we believe and how we will end up worshiping the God of all creation. Fathers and mothers, teach your children of the wonder-working power of God. His power is manifest in every plan. Not that God is manifest in every plan, but his power is manifest in every plan, in every tree that bears fruit. And so Kellogg says, God is in the tree, God is in the leaf. But what is E.G. White saying? God's power is manifest in these things, while Kellogg is saying God is in these things. Take the children into the garden and explain to them how he causes the seed to grow. The farmer plows his land and source the seed but he cannot make the seed grow he must depend upon god to do what, what that which no human power can do the lord puts his own spirit in the seed causing it to spring into life and his care under his care the jam breaks through the case and closing it and springs up to develop and bear fruit now look at this statement of eg what the lord puts his own spirit into the seed she doesn't say God puts his Holy Spirit into the seed. This is something so different, and I have come to understand it like that. God does not put his Holy Spirit in the seed. God puts his spirit in the seed. We remember the omnivitality, all life coming from the spirit, but it works uh, on different spheres according to how it is received. The plants receive the spirit to nourish them, to give fruit. The human mind willingly receives the Holy Spirit for regeneration of the mind and the impress of the character of God on it. These are different planes. These are different spheres. And uh, you cannot confound the one with the other. Under his care, the jam breaks through the case and closing it and springs up to develop and bear fruit. 8326.4. The psalmist represents the presence of the infinite one as pervading the universe. And this is what Kellogg really said, that God, the Holy Spirit, pervades the universe. If I ascend up into the heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. We can never find a soul to where God is not. The ever watchful eye of omniscience is upon all our work. And although he can marshal the armies of heaven to do his will, he condescends to accept the service of frail, erring mortals. And this is Science of the Time, July 14, 1881, paragraph 10. So, as we try to wrap up again, yes, as we try to finish up, what did Kellogg again say? In uh, A.G. Daniels' letter to W. White in October 29, 1903, pages 1 uh, and 2, Kellogg said, he told me that now, he told me that he now believed in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And his view was that it was God the Holy Ghost and not God the Father that filled all space. Now, look at this point E.G. White is making. The presence of the infinite one pervades the universe. And what is Kellogg saying? God the Holy Ghost fills all space. Now, you know, you can sympathize with medical missionaries who say they meant to these things. And even you can sympathize with A.T. Jones. Don't think that he was far above temptation and he was having a superhuman mind. If you read what E.G. White is saying and what Kellogg is saying, in, in the language, these things seem the same. But in the thought, these things are very different. And in definition, you will find that these things are very different. While they are almost literally saying the same thing, their thought inspiration is so different. What E.G. White is thinking when he says that uh, the presence of God fills all universe is different from what Kellogg is thinking when he says that God, the Holy Ghost, fills all the universe. And that is why she said there's no way the teachings of the living temple can be sustained by what I have written. Again, uh, what did E.G. White reply? Today, they are coming into educational institutions and into the churches 
everywhere spiritualistic teaching that undermine faith in God and in his word. The theory that God is an essence pervading all nature is received by many who profess to believe the scriptures. But however beautiful cloth, this theory is a most dangerous deception. Now, hold on a minute. Spicer was asked, where is God? And he said, God is in heaven. And he was told, God is everywhere. And he was asked, where is the throne of, of God? And he said, you know what? The throne of God is in heaven. He said, no, where God is, that is where his throne is. This idea that God is an essence pervading or everything, Sister White calls them, it was a spiritualistic view of things because it removes God from his physical local location to a place that he is not. God is located in heaven. His power fills the universe, but God himself is located in heaven. To say that the throne of God is everywhere, because where the presence of God is, is, that is where his throne is. And you go ahead and read uh, the how the spirit of prophecy met a crisis and see the things that are there. Uh, and uh, Kellogg reasoning out that uh, you can also read the living temple. I have read it a little bit. That uh, Can you imagine? We, he, he says about limiting God and he says that um, can you imagine how big is God's hand? If God is everywhere, how big is his hand? And he says, we limit the Lord so much. Uh, I wish we could go into details on these things, but uh, I give you the liberty of reading those works. That is how the spirit of prophecy met a crisis and uh, the book, The Living Temple again. But read it if you are strong in faith and ask God the grace if you want to read it so that uh, at the end of the day, you may not say, I see nothing different from what E.G. White says when she said there is a lot. E.G. White had to say, you are not sound in the faith. I have stated this in my diary months ago. You have certainly placed the people of God whom the Lord has led step by step in the ways of truth and placed upon a solid foundation in a false showing before unbelievers. Some have departed from the faith and will continue to misrepresent the work God has given me. The sanctuary question is a clear and definite doctrine as we have held it as a people. She is talking to Kellogg. He is writing about the living temple. But the prophetess is asked, telling her the sanctuary question is clear. Meaning what? Whatsoever Kellogg was teaching was undermining the sanctuary message. That is why we read when she said, what she said, I saw the sanctuary was gone because God now is not in his sanctuary. And I saw the atonement was gone. Why? Because God is in everything. And the sinner doesn't have to open the door of the heart for God to come in. Because God is in everything and in everywhere. Why need for him to knock in Revelation chapter 13 for the sinner for the sinner to repent and he come in and sup with him if God is in everything? The sanctuary was gone because God is not in the sanctuary but everywhere. Atonement was gone because God is in everything. And why need to repent? Just develop the Godhood in you as the new ages would have to say it. So, she said, the sanctuary question is a clear and definite doctrine as we have held it as a people. You are not definitely clear on the personality of God. So she connects the personality of God with the sanctuary question. Now, let us think about that for a moment. If you have the personality of God wrong, then you will have the sanctuary question wrong. Those are not my words. I'll read it again so that uh, we may connect together. The sanctuary question is as clear and definite doctrine as we have held it as a people. You are not definitely clear on the personality of God, which is everything to us as a people. The moment we start having erroneous ideas about the personality of God and Christ and the Spirit, we will have the sanctuary question as wrong also. You have virtually destroyed the Lord God himself. E.G.Y. to John Harvey Kellogg, letter 300, March 16, 1903. Why should Ellen White introduce the concept of the sanctuary in her replies to pantheism and personality of God? Because God was being removed from the sanctuary and placed everywhere. This is destroying the personality of God. Men are repeating the same sentiments of Kellogg. She says, I thought that this would surely be designed and that it will not be necessary for me to say anything about it. But since the claim has been made that the teachings of this book can be sustained by my by statements from my writings, I am compelled to speak in denial of this claim. Letter 211, 
1903. And what worried E.G. White most is that all the OTG present truth members of that time had read the book by Kellogg and did not see anything wrong in it. It shocked her that she said, I was shown a platform braced by solid timber, the truth of the word of God. Someone high in responsibility in the medical missionary, medical work was directing this man and that man to loosen the timber supporting this platform. Then I heard a voice saying, where are the watchmen that, that ought to be standing on the walls of Zion? Are they asleep? This foundation was built by the master worker and will stand storm and tempest. Will they permit this man to present doctrines that deny the past experience of the people of God? The time has come to take a decided action. Letter 240 to 1903. I saw that blindness had fallen upon some who had long known the truth. I pray that the Lord will open the eyes of these ministers, that they may see the difference between light and darkness, between truth and error. Special Testimony Series B, Volume 7, page 35, Paragraph 1. Where were the watchmen who had long known the truth and ought to be standing in the walls of Zion? They were saying, that we find in the book living temple nothing which appears to be to us to be contrary to the bible or the fundamental principles of the christian religion and that we see no reason why it may not be recommended by the committee for circulation in the manner suggested and so can you imagine that and why had they been deceived because eg white had said upon all created things is in the embrace of deity and there is uh, an in infinite power working upon nature and what else? A mysterious life pervades all nature, a life that sustains the unnumbered worlds throughout immensity, that lives in the insect atom which floats in the summer breeze, that wings the flight of the swallow and feeds the young ravens which cry, that brings the bird to blossom and the flower to fruit. Education 99.1. I want to raise the case there on uh, this presentation on uh, a closer look at what Kellogg believed, a case study of what he meant rather than what people think he meant. And um, as we continue in this series of prophets and the messenger, I'll be able to delve fully in the, uh, when I'm presenting the prophetess among us, meet it, where actually we see a lot of statements that E.G. White had to speak and the statements that uh, Kellogg had to speak. I think that... Uh, this is just a synopsis of the crisis that we had. And uh, why do I have to involve E.G. White and uh, Kellogg in the same bracket and uh, talk about these things? It is because it is not an easy thing to be a messenger of the Lord amid such a crisis where people are not seeing the things the way you see them. And uh, you see today, we can form friendship with people who oppose the truth. But the prophets had to weep about all these things. And we have to think, what is our position today when such a things are happening among us? Sometimes we go to extreme overboard. And uh, in the previous presentation, I talked about do everything you can do to save the doctor. How E.G. White struggled to make sure that Kellogg could be saved. And she said, compromise your opinions. Compromise your judgment just to win this person back to the truth. But remain firm in the principles. Today, such a message is being given to us. But then again, we have to meet it. And uh, we need a lot of wisdom from God to be able to discern between truth and error. Because the watchmen at that time could not discern between the track of lie and the track of truth. Because they lie so close. Kellogg said, whatever E.G. White is speaking, it's what I'm speaking. But yes, literally what E.G. White was speaking is what Kellogg was speaking. But the thoughts and the concepts behind these literal uh, similarities is something that uh, was of a big difference. And while the other was sweeping away the whole economy of the sanctuary and the personality of God, the other was magnifying the atonement and how people could appreciate amidst the degraded world, God was still working in the very things that have been affected by sin. And so may God help us. May he just uh, help us to understand the things at stake. Sometimes when these things are presented, it seems that uh, 
you are attacking somebody or you hate the pioneers and all that stuff but uh, this is not the case it is just about revisiting our history so that uh, we may understand better where we have come from and where we are going uh, i talked about the identity crisis that we are having we have been robbed of our identity and a person who have been robbed of his identity would behave like a slave when he is a heir of everything. And this is the same situation we are in. And why are we where we are today? Because of our Laodicean state. We think that we are increased in richness. We have need of nothing when the Lord says that uh, we are poor and wretched. The Lord wants to open our eyes so that we may not have uh, spiritualistic ideas of who he is and placing nature where God should be and uh, placing God where nature is. He doesn't want us to sweep away the whole economy of the sanctuary and obliterate atonement. And so may the Lord bless us. And uh, if there is anything that uh, maybe need to be straightened, put it in the comments and uh, may God bless us. Shall we uh, pray as we, we bring this to a close? Our dear God, thank you for uh, these sessions and uh, may your face shine upon us again. And uh, may we live to glorify your name forevermore. Thank you for our past history because they will guide us to face the future with uh, certainty. And uh, bless your children. If this message will be received in a negative way, Lord, may you cause in the hearts of the people to think about these things again. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.